trying to interpret my mumbling. About a generation ago, and it gives me the shudders to think that it was a generation ago, I was running around the country, sitting up all night in cemeteries, and sitting on hilltops in remote parts of the country, uh, looking for these funny lights in the sky that were everywhere in the 1960s. There was one hilltop in particular that overlooked the Ohio River, uh, where there were, at that time, there was a lot of boat traffic on the Ohio River day and night. And these funny lights would come down out of the sky and circle around these boats that were transporting cargo up the Ohio River. And the boatmen would turn on their searchlights and play games with these lights. The lights would jump out of the way of the searchlights. And I was sitting on my hilltop watching them with these games going on. So, of course, eventually the lights came over to the hilltop where I was sitting. And I had a very powerful flashlight at that time. It had six cells in it. It was a big, a long flashlight. It would shine for about a mile. And I would flash this flashlight at these funny lights, and they would jump out of the way of my flashlight. So it occurred to me to use Morse code and see if I could give them some commands, like descend, or go left, or go right. And so I'd flash in Morse code at these lights, and they would do whatever I ordered them to do. And then later, I decided that instead of using Morse code, I'd make up my own code and see what would happen. And so naturally, I was the only person in the universe that knew this code. And they knew this code, <laughs> which gave me a lot of concern at the time. <laughs> so I, I would uh, do simple things, like I'd, I'd flash the flashlight in a circle for go right, and the object would go right or I'd flash it in a triangle, and it would go left, because that was my code, go left at the, at the triangle. And I gradually figured out during this period that we could control these so-called flying saucers. They weren't saucers, they were lights. We should make that clear. There were, there were no metallic objects in, involved with these lights. These were very bright lights, and they were everywhere during that period. One night I was sitting on this hilltop. I had a favorite hilltop outside of a little town called Point Pleasant, West Virginia. I was sitting on, uh, alone in my car. Usually I had other people with me to watch me carry out these stupid things. And I was sitting alone, and one of these lights came down very close to my car and passed over. The, uh, there was a wooded area all around me. These hills were all hill, wooded uh, hills and it passed over these woods, and it seemed to descend right into the forest right next to my car. And I sat there for a few minutes. Now remember, I've been doing this for a long time already, and I was scared to death. I thought that somebody or something was gonna come out of these woods and say, hello, John Keel, you wanna take a ride? <laughs> of course, not, not, this did not happen, but the next day, uh, in those days, I was staying in a motel on the other side of the river in Gallipolis, Ohio. And the next day when I woke up in my motel room there, my eyes were very sore, like they were full of sand. And this is a common effect of looking at these lights. It's called conjunctivitis. Uh, it's like looking into a bright arc light. And so the fact that my eyes were affected was proof that I had seen something so I went to the local police, and they came back with me to this hilltop. Now it's in broad daylight. And we went into that wooded area, and I half expected to see trees knocked over, uh, something burned, uh, and I expected to find something in the, that wooded area. And I was very disappointed to find absolutely nothing, no trace of this thing that I had seen from the, right down into the woods. There was no burned area. There was. No, no limbs knocked off of trees. And I was very embarrassed because I had the police with me now. And, and w they were running around with Geiger counters, and of course nothing was registering on the Geiger, Geiger counter. So I had made a complete ass of myself once again, which, of course, is a major career of mine. <laughs> now, in the year 
years 1964 to 1968, there was a worldwide epidemic of these lights. And I don't mean that they were, it was an occasional light in the sky. They were everywhere, every damn night of the week. And you could name any town in Africa or in France or in China, people were seeing these lights. And some of these lights came down very close, like the one that I came down close to my car. And a lot of people were affected the way I was affected, with burnt eyes. Uh, in, in one case, which I mentioned in my, one of my books, uh, there was a young couple in a lover's lane doing things that people do in lover's lanes. And this thing came down next to their car, this very bright light. And the next day, they were horrified to find that they were sunburned from head to foot because they didn't have clothes on. <laughs> and this was very hard to explain because it was winter time. And he, these two young people uh, had a sunburn from being parked on the lover's lane. Some of you are probably uh, old enough to remember that period of uh, 64 to 68. There, were, there was a lot of things going on, uh, you know, the Vietnamese War and many other things. But these lights in the sky commanded a lot of attention in the press at that time. Uh, Time Magazine did big uh, editorials about it. The New York Times did front page stories about it. Uh, all of the newspapers were carrying articles about these funny lights. New Yorker Magazine, which is usually too sophisticated to bother with such things, they carried a piece on it. And uh, nobody, including the Air Force, knew what the hell these lights were. So I decided at, at that time, I lived in New York City, but I was, I was running all over the country, I had been assigned by Playboy magazine to find out what was going on. And so I was spending my own money, like water, to go back and forth to West Virginia, which was about 800 miles from New York, and to other places out on Long Island, and places in Ohio and Pennsylvania. And there were little towns where the people were afraid to go out at night because there were so many of these lights buzzing them. And the lights would chase their automobiles. They, uh, there were lots of mysterious things going on with domestic animals. Uh, dogs and cats were disappearing. One little town in Connecticut lost 700 dogs in a period of about a month. And you know, some of these dogs were, they were not little poodles, they were big uh, mastiffs. Uh, uh, you know, dogs that uh, you could not catch unless they wanted to be caught. And yet these dogs were vanishing and the cats were vanishing. We had animal mutilations of all kinds, cows, sheep, so on, especially on Long Island. Now, you don't think of Long Island as having many animals, but they did have places out there. There was a, a, a farm on, at a college where they had uh, cattle and other domestic animals. And something was butchering these animals inside their compounds at the college, somehow getting over very high fences and so on. Now, I, I realized that the best way to tackle this was to pick one or two spots and make them a microcosm of the whole thing and just study everything in that spot. Learn to know the people, uh, study every event that happened, whether it was related to these things or not. Call them UFOs, but that's really not a good name for them. They were like living lights. These lights had an intelligence of their own. In one case, uh, there was an orchard in West Virginia, where uh, I, I was parked there, and I saw in the orchard, and I had other people with me in the car at the time, I saw some purple lights in the orchard, high in the trees. There were about six or eight of these purple lights, about the, each one about the size of a beach ball. And you could see right through these lights. They were, they were almost transparent. They were transparent, but they were purple. So I walked into this field, into the orchard, and these lights came to meet me. And they formed a circle around me and did like a dance around me. And the, the people who were in the car waiting for me were scared out of their wits. And uh, while they were watching me dance with these lights, they could do a movie, The Man Who Danced with Purple Lights. <laughs> while I'm dancing with these purple lights, these, these uh, ladies who were in my car, uh, from the local newspaper, they, they said that somebody came up behind the car and 
but this is a very isolated area. There are no people there, and it's the middle of the night. They said somebody came up to the car, and at first they thought somehow it was me. And then they realized I was still out in the field dancing with the lights. And somebody or something came up behind the car, and then they really got scared. And they wanted to get the hell out of there. And of course, they had to wait till I came back from my dance with the lights. Now, I, I went to that particular orchard several times that year. This, we're now, this is in the year 66, 1966. And I saw these purple lights several times. And they always behaved the same way. Except if I turned on my flashlight, then they would skitter out of the way of the light. The light beam was like a solid object to them. And they would get the hell out of the way of the light, just as the, the boatmen would flash their searchlights at them. They, uh, as I said, the, these lights were everywhere, and now down, there was a, this, down in the valley from the hilltop, there was a whole forest, a, r a rather large, thick forest. And one night, when I was up there on my hilltop, I looked down, and the whole forest had turned purple. There was a purple light, a purple glow to the entire forest. And I, I went, uh, the next day, I went to talk to the farmer who, the forest was on his land. And I asked him about this. And he said, yeah, that happens every once in a while, that the forest turns purple on us. <laughs> and he said he had a dog that once ran into the forest when it was purple, and the dog never came back. And he had lived on this farm all of his life. He'd inherited it from his parents, of course. And uh, he said he never went near the forest when it was purple, because it, there was something very wrong at that time, very weird. So we not only had little purple lights, we had a whole forest bathed in purple lights. But uh, West Virginia is a strange state anyway. <laughs> Bef long before I got there, it was strange. But I have a feeling that my presence made it even stranger. In 1952, something fell out of the skies which became known as uh, the Flatwoods Monster. Most of you have probably heard about this or read about the Flatwoods Monster. Uh, the, this light, it looked like a comet, came out of the sky and landed on a hilltop in, outside of this little village of Flatwoods, which is just a tiny cluster of houses. And a, a group of uh, young people, I can't call them teenagers because some of them were over 20, they decided to go up the hilltop to the hill up the top of the hill and investigate this whatever crashed on the top of the hill. So they climbed up the hill and they were accompanied by a little dog that belonged to one of them. When they got near the top of the hill, they were struck by a, a terrible smell. Now, normally in these cases, the smell is described like rotten eggs, which means hydrogen sulfide. But this was not the smell of hydrogen sulfide. This smelled the best way they could describe it was smell like grease hitting hot metal. And it was very, very potent, whatever it was. Uh, the dog was the smarter of the group, the smarter person in the group. The dog turned around and went back down the hill. <laughs> one of the, uh, one of the uh, young men in the group, his name was Lemon, he fainted dead away. Now, his friends had, they were all scared out of their, uh, you know, they were all wetting their pants, let's face it. They, they had to now carry their fainted comrade down the hill. But before they uh, left, around the, around the tree, a light came. And this light had two big red uh, lights on it, like two big red eyes. And then it was like a beam of light. And this is what became the Flatwoods Monster. Now, these people were so scared and uh, so busy that they really didn't get a chance to get a good look at it. So the newspaper accounts later filled in the details. <laughs> and they gave it arms and legs and uh, a, a spade-shaped head, and it became the Flatwoods Monster. Ivan Sanderson, who was a good friend of mine, a British zoologist, read about this in the newspapers. This, by the way, this story made the papers all over the country. It was carried by the wire services. Ivan was there in less than a week, and he talked to all the witnesses. <coughs> he went up to the hilltop. And he couldn't find any trace of any object or any burn marks or anything. Now, the, the uh, people who went up there originally said that there was a, an oily substance on the grass at the hill, on the top of the hill. 
But that had all evaporated. There was nothing left. The little dog ran down the hill, as I said, and got very sick. He threw up because the dog was closest to the ground and probably got the biggest whiff of this gas, whatever it was. The dog died a couple of days later. Now, if I had been there, uh, I would have had the dog an autopsy performed on the dog to find out what was in his lungs. But that was never done, so we don't know. We never identified this gas. And we never identified whatever this object was. But 1952 was a strange year for objects falling from the sky, as you know. Now, in that same area, we're talking about a place called Braxton County. In that, in that same immediate area, they were also seeing tall, hairy monsters, our Bigfoot. And uh, Bigfoot usually stinks like hell. He usually does smell of hydrogen sulfide. And sometimes you can smell Bigfoot half an hour before he shows up. So this area had a history of peculiar monster sightings and all. I should also mention that in, uh, in Flatwoods in 1952, uh, no government agent or Air Force agent or anybody like that ever bothered to come around. The story got extensive publicity in the papers. A lot of people came and questioned the witnesses, but they were mostly uh, the UFO buffs of that period. And uh, they never had any uh, Air Force representatives or government representatives come and question them. Now, we'll skip ahead a little bit. To, I, I uh, made uh, Point Pleasant, West Virginia, sort of my, my headquarters in 66, and then fanned out to the rest of West Virginia, investigating all these various things. And it was, it was my procedure in those days, it still is if I do with these things, although it's gotten very expensive to do these kind of trips. My first step in arriving in a strange town, a new town, was always to go to the police station and introduce, introduce myself to the police. Because, uh, especially in West Virginia, of course, I'm a Yankee. And uh, I, in those days, I, I carried a pile of press credentials. I, I was writing in newspaper columns and so on. So I would introduce myself to the police so that they knew I was uh, just another harmless nut. Then, my, my second step was to go to the local newspaper and introduce myself there. And they always, large and small, the newspaper men always wanted to interview me and I always turned them down. I didn't want anything in the papers about me. I wanted just to know what was happening there. So my, my third step would then find, be to find the local historian. Now every town, even a town of 500 people, has somebody who fancies himself the local historian of the town. Sometimes it's the local doctor, most often it's a local librarian, but there, and often it's a, just a stringer for an out-of-town newspaper, or the local gossip. But there's always somebody in that town who figured, called himself the local historian. So those are the three contacts I would make first before, before I would go out and talk to witnesses and such. I would always ask the police my usual list of peculiar questions, and I still do this, and, I, and they always act astonished. One of my questions was, has anybody been killed by lightning here lately? Now, this does, it doesn't happen very often. It happens about 800 times a year worldwide. But whenever I asked these police in these towns where they were having a lot of UFO sightings, their mouths would drop and they'd say, my God, how'd you know? Just last week, somebody got killed by a lightning bolt. As I say, it's a very unusual occurrence. I, in one town in Ohio, I arrived at the police station just as they were bringing in a body that they had just picked up that uh, had been killed by a lightning bolt. So this, this was an odd link to all this, that there was something electrical going on in these towns. In, uh, in West Virginia and in Ohio, there was somebody, uh, you remember this is 30 years ago now, Th times have changed now so that th this is not uncommon today, but it was uncommon then. 30 years ago, somebody was chasing around West Virginia and Ohio 
in an old automobile, uh, harassing young ladies in their cars, trying to drive them off the road and so on. And they described this man, probably a man in his 30s, as wearing a fright wig. And he, he was always driving a, what looked like a, a car that was 10 or 15 years old, but kept in very good condition. So it didn't take me long to figure out that there was somebody like a serial rapist on the loose in that area. And I would approach my friends at the police, different police departments, and say, hey, I've heard these stories. There's a, there's a maniac on the loose here. And, and they'd always poo-poo it. They'd say, oh, no, Keel, these women are making things up or what. And, and they would ignore these stories. And I warned them that there was something out of, the, out of the ordinary going on, that there was one person in that area who should be uh, probably arrested. Also, uh, Gray Barker, who lived in West Virginia, came across some of these stories on his own. In Braxton County, young people were disappearing in large numbers. Uh, these were mostly young men below the age of 20, and they would be hitchhiking to, say, a local cinema or something, and just disappear off the face of the earth. And again, I told the police that there were too many of these disappearances, that they had a maniac on the loose. And again, the police were, uh, always assured me that I was wrong and I was an out-of-towner and what did I know, that sort of thing. Now, in November of 1966, four young people in a car, an all broken down car, were driving through the local lover's lane an area that was called the TNT area, because during the Second World War, there was a TNT plant there. Uh, actually, it's, it's more complicated than that. They were making parts for atom bombs there, but that's a long, involved story. Uh, anyway, these, there was an old building in there that they called the power plant. It was a building that housed generators for these uh, TNT factories. And they were driving past this building and they saw what looked like a very large man, uh, six or seven feet tall, standing next to this power plant. And for some reason, they were all, it's, he scared the death out of them. They were all scared to death. So the, uh, the boy who was driving hit the, hit the accelerator, and they drove out of there at a high speed. And looking back, this thing rose up in the air and followed their car. And they were going over 60 miles an hour through on these dirt roads, and this thing was flying right along with them. So they drove straight to the police station. Now, you have to realize in small towns, teenagers do not go to the police station voluntarily. <laughs> but they were so scared, they, they went to the police and reported this. And the police were so convinced by their uh, behavior that they held a press conference the next day. And reporters from the local newspapers, from Charlotte and other cities around there, came to hear this very bizarre story of this flying man. And the, uh, the four teenagers gave a very convincing account of it. And the newspapers, at that time, Batman was very popular on television. So the newspapers labeled this creature Mothman. And that was the beginning of the Mothman caper, I guess you'd call it. Now, as luck would have it, I was in West Virginia, in a place called Beckley, West Virginia, where I was investigating the case of a cat with wings. <laughs> <laughs> this cat had become a national celebrity. It had wings, and uh, at that time, Dave Garraway was doing the Today Show, and he uh, flew the boy who owned the cat and the cat to New York, and they appeared on television. And then shortly afterwards, a woman in the area claimed that the cat, the cat was named Thomas, by the way, claimed that the cat was really her cat. And then the wings fell off, and then she said, oh, no, that's not my cat. And the boy charged 10 cents a person. Uh, so if you wanted to take a look at this cat, it would cost you 10 cents. So everybody thought the boy was getting rich. He probably made all of two or three dollars out of this. 
Anyway, I was investigating, fearlessly investigating, the wing of cabin when the Mothman story broke. And so I, I went up to Point Pleasant, West Virginia, and that was the beginning of that whole thing. In the, the next year, there were over 100 reports of this Mothman. Uh, some of the people who reported seeing this thing were not only adults, they were responsible adults like bankers and uh, local officials, the lady who was sort of the head of the Chamber of Commerce. Uh, a lot of people saw this, and in my book, which we already have no copies of, uh, in my book I, I give a, a table of uh, some, uh, some of the hundred uh, reports that we collected. Now, I was, every time I would go back to New York, try to figure out how to make a living, my phone would ring and something new would happen in West Virginia and I'd have to turn around and go back all the way 800 miles back to West Virginia. And uh, winter came and uh, there was a lot of snow on the ground. There were no footprints for this, this moth man. And some of these people had seen this uh, creature uh, walking around and making strange noises. But it didn't leave footprints in the snow. It didn't leave any physical matter, like fecal matter, or anything that I could pick up and have analyzed. And all of the descriptions pretty much matched, except some people said the eyes were blazing red eyes. And some, most people said they couldn't see the face at all. It would be in the dark, and they would just see this giant figure come bearing down on it, and then they'd see it fly away. Some of the people that I talked to when I talked to them in depth, it was obvious that they had been in a kind of a trance state when they saw this creature. Uh, I mentioned there a banker had seen it. Well, what happened to the banker was he heard a noise, and he went out on his front porch, and he stood there for 20 minutes. And his wife was inside watching television. And finally, 20 minutes later, he staggered into the house, and she said he looked like he had seen a ghost. He was pale and shaking. And he didn't realize 20 minutes had passed. And he, he claimed that during those 20 minutes, during that period when he was outside, this creature was standing on his lawn staring at him, and he couldn't move. Well, to make a, a really long and complicated story short, uh, in the Christmas season of 1967, in Point Pleasant, West Virginia, there was a bridge called the Silver Bridge that crossed the Ohio River. And on December 15, 1967, that bridge collapsed, and it was loaded down with cars, uh, people who had been Christmas shopping, trucks. The, the, it was an old rickety bridge. Every time I drove across it, I was scared. It was shaking so. And a, lo a lot of people, over 50 people, died in that uh, collapse of that bridge. And that sort of, sort of put a damper on all my investigations because I knew some of the people who had gone down with the bridge. And some of these people had been Mothman witnesses. And I, I was very shaken up by all of this. Because, uh, as you can imagine, everybody in the town in Point Pleasant was you know, very upset by this. And so I did just one magazine article on the whole subject. And it was a short article. It was about 2,000 words. And it was published in Saga, Saga Magazine. And I decided that I wouldn't write any more about it because of the disaster. Now, other people were collecting the clippings and all on the Mothman, too. And they, they were lecturing about Mothman. They were running around and writing about Mothman. And you know most of their names. There were Lauren Coleman, Jerry Clark, Jim Mosley went on a lot of TV shows to talk about Moth Mothman. Uh, the Gray Barker, who lived in West Virginia, wrote and published a book about it in 1970 called The Silver Bridge. But I, I published nothing on it. I gave one talk on the radio about it on Long John Neville's show. And that was the extent of my involvement. Now today, when you pick up any uh, encyclopedia of the strange or anything, it always says that John Keel is the center of the Mothman thing. And uh, one of the newspapers in West Virginia did a long editorial against me, saying that I was exploiting the situation and making a big profit from it. Of course, 
little do they know I made no profit at all from it. I'm still not making a profit from it. Get out there and buy those books. <laughs> now, the, my book came out in 1975, and that was the year that the police in West Virginia discovered a cave filled with bodies. They, because the animals and all had been in there, and the bodies had been rotting for a long time, this is the thing we're not eating now. Uh, they couldn't tell how many bodies there were, but they think there were 20 or 30 bodies in that cave. So I was right about a serial killer on the loose there. And now it even gets stickier. The police, after a rather short investigation, dropped the whole thing. And you find, when you're dealing with small town police, are there any small town police here ready to give me the business? Uh, The reason our suicide rate in the United States is so high is because they often put murders down as suicide in small towns because they don't want a murder on the book, unsolved murder on the books. And very often they know who committed the murder, but they figure, well, he deserved getting murdered, so uh, we'll just forget about it. It seems like everyone in West Virginia knows who this killer was, and I wouldn't dare give his name here. But he, he belongs to a prominent family in West Virginia. And uh, the reason that they know is that he was put away for a while in a me uh, mental institution. And while he was in the mental institution, all of the uh, disappearances and all stopped. Then when he was released from the mental institution, they started up again. Now, I don't have a, a latest report on that. I don't know if those are still going on or if this fellow is still on the loose. I hope he's not. And as I say, for a New Yorker to get involved in West Virginia uh, affairs like that, it's a pretty sticky wicket. And uh, it was better, it, it was, uh, what would be the term? It was smarter of me to stay out of it. Uh, are still going on in West Virginia. I still get mail from a lot of people down there, some of the people that I knew 30 years ago. Now, also one of the mysteries that I tried to untangle and found hopeless was that there were a number of babies born during that period to young, young women there. And these babies seemed to be rather unusual. And after the babies were born, they were surrounded by poltergeist activity, which you've been hearing about today. And other odd things were going on with these babies, so I kept in touch with some of these families. I wondered if perhaps when these children grew up, they might be, uh, there might be something special about them. Well, the children have grown up, and there really doesn't seem to be anything special about them. Uh, but I, I did keep in touch with some of them all those years. Now. Maybe John Michel will mention, maybe he won't, uh, a phenomenon that's going on in England right now with the phantom social workers. Any of you heard about that? Well, there, there are people, ordinary looking people, going around to homes in England claiming to be social workers, and they want to examine the children in the family. And they have never harmed any of these children. And in many cases, the families get suspicious and call the cops. <coughs> especially since this has been getting publicity. Nobody knows who these phantom social workers are or what their motives are. And it's, uh, it's not just two or three people. It, uh, the descriptions vary. It's tall people, short people, fat people, thin people, all posing as social workers. But we had something very similar in West Virginia, except they would go to the homes of these families, especially the families that I was concerned with, and they would claim to be photographers, and they would want to take pictures of the newborn children. And they would promise that they would give free pictures to these families. So the family said, sure. But a lot of the West Virginia families couldn't afford to have pictures taken anyway. And so uh, these photographers, some, sometimes they would arrive in, in a, a very expensive car, and sometimes they would arrive in Volkswagen. And they would take pictures of these babies and then drive away. It made no sense at all. They never did mail the pictures to the families concerned. 
So I was chasing these phantom photographers at one point, and I, I missed some of them by minutes. And to this day, I don't know what their game was, but I put them in the same category as our phantom social workers in England. Incidentally, the, uh, the British magazine uh, 14 Times has carried a series of articles about the phantom social workers. Just, I'll, I'll close by saying that right now, in the last month, up in the Albany, New York area, we've had a minor UFO flap, again, of these lights in the sky. And uh, there have been quite a few uh, reports out of that area. And there doesn't seem to be anything special happening up there. I haven't gone out there myself, but uh, it just is another UFO wave. And, uh, of course, when the UFO buffs talk about this, they always report spacecraft. God damn it, they're lights. They're, they're intelligent lights. They're, and it's very rare that a metallic object is ever seen. And if you go through the 500,000 reports that have now been printed, you'll find very few uh, disks in comparison to the lights. Disks and met metallic objects listed. But these lights w will remain a big mystery. And I spent 30 years chasing them, and I've never caught one, so I don't know what the hell they are. I'll, I'll close with that. Am I the only one that wants to know what the purple lights? Uh, can you can you just say one word about the purple lights dancing with the lights? I think in olden times people called these fairy lights. Because this is a, this is a well-known phenomenon. But uh, I, I would have to assume that there's something else there that my eye cannot see. You know, the human eye cannot see the whole spectrum. And I, I would have to assume that what I was seeing was just part of what this thing was, whatever it was. And so that's even scarier. Maybe it had uh, six arms and fangs. <laughs> Were they ever photographed? Were they ever photographed? No. No. Uh, I, I did attempt to photograph those uh, the purple lights, and uh, when you try to photograph when you try to photograph the lights in the sky, that's what you end up with is with a little light on your film, and very often what appears on the film it looks quite different from what you saw with your naked eye. So uh, that's what keeps keeps it all confusing and keeps many UFO buffs going to the uh, therapist every week. <laughs> so, there's an urgent question with a red shirt. Um, when you were in the proximity of these lights, uh, did you have any unusual sensations like your hair standing on end? Like no. No electrical? No. no. I was looking for things like that. I, d I didn't have any, any strange feelings at all. But when I saw that big light go down into the woods, I had a tremendous sense of fear, which for me, you know, I'm very laid back. For me, it's very unusual to get that scared. I used to play with cobras, for God's sake. <laughs> Thank you.